And I am now going to turn it over to Brenda, who is one of our fabulous, amazing instructors. She also does a lot with our volunteer training. And I'll let her introduce herself and kick off our content for today. Okay. Thank you to Emmy for helping me with this. I'm not a very confident technology user. And so I'm very pleased that Emmy's here. She's going to be doing my screen sharing for me. Um, and what a wonderful diverse group we have. I haven't met everyone. I think I just saw Brittany Miller out at the barn yesterday. So that's great. Now I know who you are. Um, and thanks for tuning in from wherever you are. That's awesome. Um, so this is a first for me. Uh, what I thought we would talk about today is um, basically feeding our horses according to their size and their activity level or their job. Um, and I personally have at my home, um, now I have two full-size horses and one mini horse. Uh, but when I shot these videos and pictures that you're going to see, I had one full-size and one miniature. Um, so this is a, a lesson that I adapted from a lesson that I did for kids, but I added a lot more to it for you guys. Uh, and there's a lot of detail. So let's jump right into it. Oh, and the chat feature is um, available if you guys want to type questions and maybe at the end um, we can go through any questions you have. Okay, so for measuring horses, you have this very cool little thing. Uh, this happens to be made by Purina. It's a weight tape. So on one side it has pounds and then on the other side it has hands in inches. So when you measure a horse's height, it's always um, talked about in hands. So for example, a full-size horse is usually somewhere between 14 to 16 hands. And a hand is four inches. So we're gonna be looking at how to measure a horse's height. And then we're also gonna be looking at how to measure their weight. And the way we do that is by wrapping this tape around their girth area and this shows the pounds. Um, and then we're gonna talk about feeding according to weight. And it's really important for a miniature horse. Um, it's very tempting to feed them just like a standard size horse, but uh, it's not advisable. And I'm running into that problem. A lot of people have that problem when they have minis and regular size horses, it's kind of hard to regulate what the mini gets. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I think we'll start with a video, Emmy. Um, this is a video I shot early spring. And this first one is of measuring Remy, the miniature horse. And Emmy's gonna pull up her magic screen for you to see. And he's named after the rat in the movie Ratatouille, if you're wondering where the name came from. And starting. Oh, and you can mute that, Emmy. I do say kind of a nasty comment to my husband at the end of this video. <laughs> so we don't need to hear that. So I show him the weight tape to make sure he's okay with it. And then I measure from the ground to the base, kind of the last hair on his mane. And after these videos, I will have some close-up photos so you guys will be able to see the exact measurements. And then this is taking his weight, going around the girth area and pulling tight. And again, you'll have close-up photos of these. And then I decided just for fun to measure his hoof size compared to the standard horse. It's quite remarkable that miniature horses can stand up on these tiny feet. And I'll show you a close up of how small that hoof really is. Okay, Emmy, you can stop that video and you can share the next one that's measuring Piper. Both of these are geldings, by the way. And 
Now I show him the tape and you'll notice he gets a little worried about it. So it is windy and he doesn't like it when it flaps around. So I take my time with him, make sure he's okay with it. And his height, standard horses are measured up to the top of the withers. So the highest point um, on that bump at the base of the neck. And then I'll measure his weight. And the tape is blowing, flapping around, so I have to make sure it's smooth. And I'll have a close up of that so you'll be able to see in a minute what these numbers are. And finally, the hoof. He has nice big round feet. And we'll compare these in just a minute. Okay, I mean, that's it. And then let's go ahead and share the Google Doc, and I'll show the close up photos of the measurements. Okay, so here we have Remy and his height is really between eight and nine hands. It's a little bit hard to see. So if you do the math, eight times four is 32, eight times nine is 36. He's in between there. He's about 34 inches, which is the top of the range for miniature horse. So he's a big mini, if that makes sense. He's not a pony. He is technically a miniature horse. All right, you can scroll down. Here's a nice close up of Piper. He's about 14.3 hands. Um, he's a small horse. If he was under 14.2, he would be considered a pony. <clears throat> Go ahead and scroll down. And Remy uh, weighs about 350 pounds, which is heavy. We um, need, he has been losing since we've measured this. He's probably down to 340 now. He should be closer to about 320. All right, go ahead. Piper's weight is showing uh, 1,015, which is just about right. He's a good weight. Here's Remy's tiny hoof two and a half inches wide and scroll down and you'll see Piper's hoof, much bigger, four and a half, almost five inches wide. And you can continue to scroll and you'll see a nice picture of a comparison of the two of them on a stormy day, early spring. Um, like I said, Remy is a large miniature horse and Piper is a small standard horse. So if you had a smaller mini and a larger horse, you would see an even bigger difference there. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how much hay should each horse eat per day. Um, horses eat about 2% of their body weight in hay. So Piper needs 2% of 1,015 and Remy would need about one third of that. So not to tax your brains too much, but let's all try to figure 2% of a thousand and then you can round up a little bit so that number will be divisible by three to make our math lives easier. Um, if everybody wants to kind of think about that for a second. So the question is how many pounds of hay and or grass should Piper eat per day? And then what would one third of that be for Remy. And the reason I'm asking for a third is because Remy should weigh about one third of what Piper weighs. So if you take 2% of a thousand, you get about 20 pounds, but let's round up to 21 to make it easier. And then Remy would need seven pounds of hay and or grass. All right. And then the next thing we have is types of hay. And I'm just gonna read this to you in case anyone's having trouble seeing it. Each horse has different nutritional requirements. The age of the horse, activity level, breed and size all factor into which hay best suits their needs. Some horses require higher protein and more energy, while others need hay that is lower in protein and not as rich. 
a retired senior horse turned out in pasture doesn't have the same nutritional requirements as a high performance horse. Hay generally falls into two categories, legumes and grasses. Alfalfa hay is the most popular legume hay fed to horses in the US, while timothy, brome, and orchard are popular grass hay choices. There are cereal grain hays too, such as oat or barley hay, which are different nutritionally than typical grass hays. All right, so if we look at the nice little um, graphic there, I hope Emmy is proud of me because that looks like a graphic she might create. Um, I'll give you a second just to look at that and see the different types of hay. What I feed my horses is the brome hay under the grass category, and I get it from Nicolette, one of our instructors. She grows a really nice grass hay. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Protein levels in hay vary depending on the type of hay. Protein levels range from 8% to 14% in grass hay and 15 to 22% in legume hay. Most mature horses will do fine on lower protein hay, 10 to 12%. Horses in training need more protein to support increased muscle development and replace nitrogen that is lost during exercise. Grass hay is lower in protein than alfalfa hay. The energy content of grass hay is also generally lower than alfalfa hay. For many horses, especially mature non-working horses or horses not used for breeding, grass hay is often preferred over alfalfa. Grass hay is also a good choice for senior horses as it's easier on the kidneys due to its lower protein content and is also easier to chew and digest. Also, grass hay is often less dusty than alfalfa, so it's a good choice for horses that have respiratory issues. And if we scroll down, we'll see the hay that I feed my horses. That's the brome, smooth brome. It's a nice leafy green alfalfa, I'm sorry, grass hay. Um, it smells nice, there's no mold, there's no dust, um, and they can eat you know, quite a bit of that. I feed, my horses are very spoiled, I feed them hay four times a day to keep, keep their bellies happy. And if you scroll down, I think that's the end, Emmy. Okay, so now the fun part. We have another video, this is the last one. And I wanna show you how miniature horses behave just like standard size horses. Um, and they should be treated as such. A lot of times people think minis are different. They're so cute and little and cuddly and they kind of like big dogs, but they really are horses in every sense. And you'll see this little mini behaving like a big horse. And Emmy, you can turn the sound up because there's some snorting going on. That's pretty cute. You'll also see a pretty big kick from Remy coming up in a minute. Okay, and, and that's that. I just wanted to point out one more thing. Um, I have been asked by many a horse person, why have a mini? Just why, why bother? You can't ride them, why? <laughs> and um, I, have, I have a lot of reasons, but I thought I'd just bring up a few in case someone asks you, why would you ever have a mini? Um, I have three horses now, so if I wanna take one out for a ride or clinic, my mini is a great companion for the other horse. 
He's easy to care for. He requires a small amount of food. He's very easy on his environment, easy to clean up after. Um, but minis are also really useful. Uh, they can pull carts. They can be shown um, in all kinds of in hand, different types of shows. Um, they can be great therapy animals. We had um, Cream at our center who was a mini and also um, Bunny who was a wonderful miniature therapy horse. Um, and they're starting to be recognized as service animals, actually. Uh, a lot of benefits to using them as service animals. And um, there's probably other uses and reasons that I can't even think of. So just to wrap up and summarize, uh, we learned that feeding a horse according to its weight and activity level is very important. Uh, we learned the different types of hay. Um, we also learned how to measure horses, both in height and weight. Um, and then we got to learn that miniatures are horses in every sense and should be treated like a horse. Um, they're just smaller. They're really cute too. <laughs> so since we're still a small group, if somebody wants to unmute and ask a question or if you have a comment or something you'd like to share, feel free to do that. I don't see any written questions. I ask really quick the um, their behaviors running around the ring like that is that um, because they're kind of I guess playing with each other or was there something outside of the ring that maybe had them fired up? Yeah, that, that's a great question. That was early spring and it had rained and the weather temperature was was down. It was cool and something got them fired up outside of the arena. I don't know what it was. Uh, but they were snorting and racing around, and um, they were definitely up right then. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed with that too, Marnell, is we talk a lot when you start in with volunteer training of kind of the herd dynamics and how horses interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you saw it, but a couple of times both horses would start and kind of slow down and stop, and then one of them would get set off again, and the other would follow almost identically. And so that kind of looking at that herd dynamic as they're communicating with each other and trying to do things together and aware of the same, the same environmental factors plays into a lot of kind of how we work with horses and how we deal with them in the therapeutic riding environment too. Yeah, I know that with my dogs, I was kind of comparing it to that and how they will sometimes, you know, some, they'll smell something and get fired up and then chase each other around and I know sometimes something outside the fence will get them fired up as well. And I just wondered the correlation between them and the horses. So mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Yeah, and just to follow that up, when you go out to a pasture at Hearts and Horses to catch one of our horses, you really have to be aware of every horse out there because one will set off a chain reaction among the others. And if one is a, a particular leader or dominant horse, um, he will move the other horses around. So it's something to be aware of when you're out there just for your safety. Yeah. And when the weather changes and the temperature drops, I think we see more of that type of behavior. It's good to know. Yeah. I see a question from Brittany Williams. Um, how do you decide which types of grain, if any, or supplements you need for horses, as well as how much do you give? That's a really good question. If you've ever looked at a horse catalog, the amount of supplements will make your mind spin. Uh, it's crazy how many supplements are on the market. Most horses just need really good quality hay, a good amount of it, and, and fresh water. Um, I do give something called Purina Enrich Ration Balancer, which is a very basic grain that just adds some minerals and nutrients um, and it's for easy keepers. It's for horses that really don't require a lot of additional supplements. And I only give about a half a pound of that to my big horse. And then I literally give a large handful to Remy. Um, and that is pretty much to get them in from the pasture. I use it as a reward. <laughs> um, if you have a senior horse, they do make senior grains, which are higher in fat. Um, and they have a, like a molasses in them. Um, so for senior horses or horses that are hard to keep weight on, um, you do feed a lot more grain. But as far as supplements go, I do give a mineral block called a Redmond Rock, 
which has some extra minerals. It also encourages them to drink more water in the summer. Um, so I always have a mineral block. A regular white salt block is fine too. Um, horses do require that. Um, and like I said, it helps them make sure they're drinking enough water. So anybody else have a comment, question? I was actually gonna say, Natalie, if you wanna jump in a little bit on that question, I know Natalie does a lot of work with our herd and the different diets and supplements that we do for our horses at Herds and Horses. I don't know if there's anything you want to chime in on that one. Yeah, so um, we definitely, a uh, majority of our herd definitely gets that grass hay. Um, that's what they're uh, primarily fed. We do have a few that get alfalfa. Uh, one of our horses, his name is Zulu. He's our biggest guy that we have. Um, and so he gets a little bit of alfalfa for more of that protein aspect. Um, and then we do give grain to a majority of our horses as well. Um, across the board, they get something called ADM, um, and it's just a basic grain with just um, basic minerals and everything that they need, um, as well as the salt and mineral blocks. Um, each horse also gets a joint supplement, as well as once a month we add in, it's called psyllium, and it helps um, to reduce any um, prevention for sand colic. Um, which is when they're out in the pastures or in the paddocks and they're grazing and their piles of hay are gone, um, they can start to get into the dirt and everything. And sometimes that can cause a bit of an impaction. Um, so each of our horses also gets that once a month. Um, and in the grain as well, we also add salt, but they each have their own salt and mineral blocks in their stalls as well to also keep them to uh, stay hydrated. Great point, Natalie. I forgot, I do give psyllium also once a month. It's um... The brand I really like is called Sandrid. It's a pellet and you feed it for a week every month and it does help with that. Yep, that's exactly what we use too, Brenda. Mm -hmm. Does anyone who does anyone here own horses and have a different um, feeding regimen? Nobody? I remember when I was thinking about getting my first horse, it was only let's see, 12, 13 years ago, I was helping a friend with her horses and I was watching her feed and I said, that's all there is to it. It's just grass, hay and water. And she said, yeah, basically. And I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe I could handle that. So I think it, it just comes down to the quality of the hay. Um, I find it very difficult to keep the quality of the hay high until I found my friend Nicolette who has a great field and I can trust where it comes from. Um, but once you have a good quality hay source and they have plenty of it and plenty of water, um, clean water to drink, it's not that hard to feed horses. You can also get your hay analyzed. Um, like CSU would probably do that here for us, Colorado State University. There are extension offices that you can go to that will analyze the nutritional value of your hay, and then you can know exactly what you're feeding. Yes, question. I have a question. How many times a day do you feed the horses, and is it different based on their activity? Because I've noticed like when we bring them in, we'll give them a snack yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day. So. Do they get like snacks all day if they're working or do they get fed in the morning and then at night or how does that work? Um, Natalie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe at Hearts and Horses, they get fed hay three times a day. And the grain um, usually is with one of those feedings. Um, horses are generally grazers. You know, in the wild they graze, I think up to something like 18 hours a day. Um, and that's what they are, they're grazers. So to fit them into a human feeding schedule is not really fair. There's a lot of things on the market that have been created to try to create a more natural feeding system or to slow horses down. At Hearts and Horses, we use hay bags, which have a mesh uh, front that uh, makes it harder for the horses to pull the hay out of, and therefore it takes longer um, for them to eat, which is a great idea. So slow feeders are something you can use to spread that hay out throughout the day. Um, I feed mine in tubs. I find that they paw and kick and destroy the slow feeders and they end up injuring themselves. <laughs> so for me, it's, and my husband works from home and he's a wonderful horse husband. Um, so for us, we feed early morning, 
we feed a snack at around 2.30, we feed them dinner, hay dinner around six, and then we give them a nighttime hay just before bed. Because if you can keep that digestive tract moving, it's much better for them. Mm -hmm. You might have heard the word colic. It's a very bad word. Um, if you keep them. Can you explain what that means? Because I think yeah. that's what it is, but I don't really. <laughs> it's a very general term. Like if you said, oh, I have a stomach ache. Well, you're not really sure exactly what's going on with you, but something feels bad. And you know, horse's digestive tract is so long. I think if you stretched it out, it would be miles long of intestines. Their stomach is very small. So as the food passes through the intestines, sometimes you have a blockage. It can be hay, it can be debris that they picked up. Um, you can also have a gas colic, just a big gas bubble. So colic is just kind of a digestive distress, overall umbrella term for something not right in the digestive system. Um, and it can be treated. Sometimes it can be fatal. Um, and there's a variety of reasons. Sometimes you never know what caused it. Um, but the, the best thing you can do is keep them eating a regular, on a regular schedule and keep that food going through that system as much as possible um, with plenty of water. Is it like, um, so it just could be a blockage. It doesn't have to necessarily, because I always imagined it almost like a torsion in dogs. Is it can be a twist for sure. Mm -hmm. It can be a twist. It can be a tear in the intestine. Um, it can be a, a actual blockage um, or it can be a gas bubble. Um, you'll see vets put a tube up the horse's nose and pump mineral oil and fluids through there to try to create um, lubrication for that blockage to pass that can help. Um, you'll, they'll give banamine, which is an analgesic to kind of help relax them. And then sometimes there's just nothing that can be done. We lost our big quarter horse to colic in January and the vet, he was 22 almost. And the vet tried all the treatments and that didn't work. So we just had to put him down. There was no other choice. Um, he wasn't eating or drinking and was clearly in pain. Um, and so that's unfortunate. We don't know what caused it. Just to add, Brenda, um, another thing that can make colic tricky is that horses actually can't um, get sick. So there really is only one way for everything to go. So that also adds to the complexity of what that colic may be. Thank you, Natalie. I see a comment from Brittany Williams that um, they lost their thoroughbred Gracie, who was 15, to colic in January as well, and it was a stomach impaction with colic. So, yeah, they are, you know, you hear the term healthy as a horse all the time, but they're kind of, they can be kind of delicate and a little bit fragile. Um, sometimes it doesn't take much to cause a serious problem. So we, we just do our best. One thing that I was gonna add to the original question about how many times a day to feed and things like that, I know one of the thing that things that plays into that schedule for our horses at Hearts and Horses is where they're turned out. Some of our horses are turned out into pastures where there's grass so they can graze. Some of them are turned out to dry lots where there's not grass for them to graze. So I know that plays into, you know, like for the lunch meal, we'll go out and put hay out for those horses who can't graze, but we wouldn't put out that extra third meal for the horses who can graze because they're getting that extra nutrition from the grass itself. So that kind of, sometimes there's little nuances in that element too, if you're letting them graze. Good point. And horses can get too much grass, especially in the spring. Um, and there are actually even certain times of day when the grass has higher sugar um, then other times, I believe it's at night when it's higher sugar. So sometimes you have to be really careful. I mean, ideally horses would be out on pasture all the time, but um, they can founder, they can have um, problems with the sugars and the grasses. And again, with miniature horses, they should not be grazing full time. That's um, really too much. I'll see minis out with big horses all day and I'll just shake my head because they don't need that much. They just don't, but it's hard to manage that. So what I do when I turn my 
three out. They, they only go out in the first thing in the morning and they go out for 90 minutes and that's it. That's all they get because that's all the mini needs. The bigger horses could graze for longer, um, but I don't have a setup to really allow that at my house. So they get 90 minutes of grass in the morning and then that's it. Yeah, it reminds me of a pony that we had for a while, Hocus Pocus, who was diabetic. Oh, right. So he had very specific grasses that he could have because some grasses were too high sugar for him and only certain things were a low enough sugar content that he could actually eat them. So he was on a very specific diet. Mm -hmm. Which is part of why we have that no hand feeding any treats or anything to the horse's world because a lot of them being older horses do have very specific medical needs and dietary needs and so we don't want to upset that by as cute as they look as much as they really ask you and really want that treat and they really want you to grab that grass for them it's usually not safe for them right Some i don't know how good this microphone is but one of my horses was just calling out there <laughs> so Well, you guys have been a wonderful audience. This is super easy, so thank you, everyone. Did anyone else wanna say anything or have any feedback? I can't wait to meet you all. I mean, the one in Hawaii, who was that? Chrissy. Chrissy, I would love to meet you too, but that's kind of far to go. <laughs> hey, on one of these days, right? <laughs> You're welcome anytime. Thank you. <laughs> yes, can't wait to see everyone. We miss the volunteers so much. I've been teaching now for three days and it is not the same without the volunteers. It's just a very strange, surreal mm -hmm. feeling out there. I just miss my volunteers a lot. <laughs> it's just not the same. It's so. pretty surreal not being there too, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. For those of you who are horse leader trained, um, take a look at the volunteer newsletter that went out today because I did include some information on what that process is going to look like for coming back as horse leader volunteers for phase two. So hopefully at least a couple of you will be able to get back in the swing of things soon. But we really do miss everyone. It's very sad and lonely out there without you. <laughs> I'm by myself right now. <laughs> Case in point. <laughs> We're with you in spirit. I can feel you guys. <laughs> and I'll see you tomorrow, Natalie. Yeah. yeah. Or not tomorrow. Today's yeah, Thursday. Saturday. I'll see you Saturday. <laughs> I did the same thing yesterday. <laughs> and we're all still figuring out what day it is. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, if you do come up with any questions at any point, feel free to email me and I will connect you to the person who can answer them. And hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks for joining.